Hey everybody, welcome to Altium Academy. I am your host, Zach Peterson. I'm also a technical consultant for Altium. And today we're gonna to be talking about crosstalk and specifically the different types of crosstalk and how it arises in your PCB. What is crosstalk exactly and why does it occur? Well, that's one thing we're gonna look at and then we'll be able to see the different types of crosstalk and exactly what their signal characteristics are as well as some strategies for how to solve it. All right, let's get started. So when we want to get started talking about crosstalk, typically what we're looking at is two single-ended signals on a PCB or in some other type of system. So right now what I'm going to talk about is in the context of PCB design, but crosstalk can arise just generally between two wires and it doesn't have to just be on a PCB. Typically the situation that we look at is we have a driver, usually draw it with like the AC symbol, then we have our wire, um, this is our interconnect that has an impedance Z sub zero. We'll just draw out a little impedance box here. And then it terminates at some load, call it Z sub L. And then that goes to ground. And then here we have a second line. And this second line could also be connected to a driver and it has some impedance Z sub zero. And it is also terminated at some load, which is then connected to ground. How do we describe crosstalk between these two lines? Well, first we have to describe how noise is coupled from one line to the other line. So when we're describing crosstalk, we have two lines. We have an aggressor line, and then we have a victim line. And as the names suggest, the aggressor is going to induce some noise on the victim. Now, of course, the situation could be reversed. The victim could be driving a signal, and it could then induce some noise into the other trace. So the two roles can be swapped. Okay, so when we have a signal that is on the aggressor line and it is traveling towards the load, during this switching event, it is these switching events that can induce noise on this victim trace. So what happens here is during this switching action, this is the period in time where you will have a dv dt or a change in the voltage of this signal over time and some di dt meaning some rate in the change of the current over time and so it's these two quantities that determine how noise is coupled into this victim trace so during this time the dv dt term will determine how much current is induced in this victim trace now the current here is determined by you may have guessed the mutual capacitance between these two. So the mutual capacitance multiplied by my rate of change in the voltage gives me the current that gets induced in this interconnect. So the rate of change in voltage induces a current through the capacitance. And then as you may have guessed, the magnetic field that's generated by this changing current in the aggressor trace induces an electromotive force or a voltage in the victim trace. So the voltage that gets induced is gonna be due to the mutual inductance multiplied by the rate of change of the current over time, okay? So it's this term here that determines the voltage that is induced during these transitions and the current is induced through mutual capacitance. The mutual capacitance that exists between these two lines arises because if you look on a printed circuit board, when I have two lines that are routed next to each other, let's just assume for the moment that they're transmission lines, they'll have some capacitance uh, with respect to the ground plane on the next layer, and we'll call that the line capacitance. However, there's also gonna be some capacitance between them, and that is our mutual capacitance. Similarly, we can draw out a similar diagram for the inductance. Each of these traces will have some inductance due to its position above the ground plane on one of the next layers. And then the fact that you have these two inductive uh, elements coupled together gives you a mutual inductance. So it's the spacing between the traces as well as the size of the traces and the distance to the ground plane that's going to determine your mutual capacitance 
and your mutual inductance. So this is all the kind of stuff that we've talked about before when we talk about parasitics in a PCB layout. It's all the same concept. And the point here is that these parasitics, the mutual capacitance and the mutual inductance, is what's going to allow a signal on one of my traces to then induce a displacement current into this other trace through the mutual capacitance or to excite a voltage through the mutual inductance. So those are the two terms that determine crosstalk. Okay, so that's what happens if we just look at like the circuit characteristics and we're starting to talk about the mutual capacitance and inductance. So how much crosstalk can you expect when you have two lines that are being routed next to each other on your PCB? So to answer that question, let's just look at what happens if we have a situation kind of like this where I have a board I have my victim trace being routed down here. And then maybe I have a trace that comes in like this and starts routing alongside my victim trace. Now the spacing between these two is what's gonna give me my mutual capacitance and my mutual inductance. Also, don't forget, on the next layer we've got ground. And then the width of the traces themselves will determine their, uh, their own capacitance and their own inductance. During the course where this signal is traveling and then rising up to its maximum value, what actually happens is this portion in time, or this window in time, will overlap with a section of the trace in space. So that's what gives us a coupling length, L. So what happens is during this signal swing on the aggressor trace, the crosstalk signal will get induced just in this region of the victim trace. And then what happens is that signal can then travel forwards or backwards. Same thing on the, on the falling edge. During the falling edge, the signal can travel either forwards or backwards. So it's during these two switches that you have the signal being induced on the victim trace. And so if we look at the capacitive portion and the inductive portion together, we can determine a total amount of crosstalk that is induced and then travels forward or backwards to the receiver end and the transmitter end of this interconnect. So this portion of the crosstalk that travels backwards compared to the direction our uh, inducing signal is traveling, this is called near-end crosstalk or backward crosstalk. And so the abbreviation is near-end crosstalk or NEXT. Here we tend to call this forward crosstalk or far-end crosstalk or FE. XT. So if you actually do some of the math and look at the capacitive and the inductive contributions to each of these types of crosstalk, you can actually learn a little bit about how much crosstalk you can expect for each contribution. There are a lot of guides out there on how to actually derive NEXT and FEXT. What I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to show you the result and then we can discuss it a little bit and see what some of the implications are because it is pretty interesting. So first, let's look at near-end crosstalk. So NEXT, or near-end crosstalk, is defined as a ratio of the induced voltage to the uh, aggressor. Here, this is the voltage on my victim, and this is the voltage on my aggressor. And this is defined as one-fourth times this fraction. So this is the mutual capacitance divided by my line's capacitance, and then the mutual inductance divided by the line's inductance. So this L sub L term, this is just the line's inductance per unit length. And so when you're designing a trace like inside Altium Designer and you're using the layer stack manager with the impedance tool, it will actually tell you what this value is. Same thing for the capacitance. When you're doing an impedance calculation in the layer stack manager, it will tell you what the capacitance is. What we have here is we see something actually really interesting. We actually see that near-end crosstalk does not depend on the rise time as long as this portion of the trace is long enough. So that's actually pretty interesting because the correct way, in my opinion, to write this is to write this using this one-fourth and then this fraction, the length, divided by the distance the signal travels during its rise time and then multiplied by our capacitive and inductive contributions. Now, this fraction here, 
is normally just given a value of one. So essentially what that means is that once the length becomes long enough, eventually this trace will be long enough to encompass the entire region of this rise time and you'll get to your maximum crosstalk value. So this fraction is always gonna be less than or equal to one and that's normally omitted. Now there's a really good uh, article from Polar Instruments that actually states this explicitly. They just don't do it with this formula. So just keep that in mind. In most cases where you're worried about crosstalk, this fraction is gonna be one. You don't even need to worry about it. So next let's look at far end crosstalk or F-E-X-T. So far end crosstalk is equal to one half multiplied by this length over the rise time distance and then it's multiplied by this difference in the capacitive and inductive contributions to foreign crosstalk. So this is interesting here. So again, our L here is our coupled length. So it is just this length of this section of trace where the two lines are coupled. So eventually this will rise up to some maximum value during this length. However, in this case, foreign crosstalk does depend on the rise time. So if I make this rise time for this signal much faster, meaning I make the rise time smaller, then far end crosstalk is going to get more intense. Now, this minus sign, this is where it really gets interesting. This minus sign essentially tells you that if this portion of the equation in parentheses is equal to zero, then there won't be any far end crosstalk. So essentially if this fraction is equal to this fraction, then these two terms subtract each other and I get zero on the right hand side. So I would have no far end crosstalk. So when does that actually happen? Well, this happens when the capacitive portion and the inductive portion of far end crosstalk are equal. That's the only way you're gonna get this fraction equal in value to this fraction. The two will then cancel, you'll have no far end crosstalk. So this can actually happen with strip lines in certain cases. So let's take a look at some strip lines to see how this actually arises. When we have a strip line configuration in the internal layers of a PCB, I basically have something like this. I've got my two surfaces and I've got ground above and then I've got ground below and then I've got a trace routed here and then I've got a trace routed here. Now these are normally going to be routed like this. We have a layer separation here where these traces are etched onto this lower layer and then the upper layer is bonded on top. And so we have a sandwich like this. So in this configuration, normally what you have is a DK value down here. And the DK value up here could be different depending on the materials that you're using. However, if these two DK values are the same, meaning you have a totally homogeneous dielectric in the interior layers of this PCB to support these strip lines, then these two contributions to capacitive and inductive portions of the far end crosstalk will also be the same. And so these will cancel. So this is a special case where you have the same dielectric above and below the two traces, and that is what's going to allow the far end crosstalk to cancel. So does that always happen? Not necessarily. Sometimes you're using two slightly different materials, they have slightly different DK values, and as a result, you don't get perfect cancellation of the far end crosstalk. The result is that, however, if you make the top DK approach or become very close to the bottom DK, then you're gonna be able to make far end crosstalk smaller because these two terms are gonna become more similar and you'll get far end crosstalk closer to zero. Why don't we have this situation with microstrips? Well, with microstrips, we have a DK value for our substrate. However, up here we have air. And so the DK value is just about one. It's like 1.003 or something like that, but it's, it's pretty close to one. Whereas this is actually something more like four to even as high as 4.8 in some dielectrics. That is what's going to prevent these two fractions from totally canceling each other. And then as a result, there will be some far end crosstalk in these microstrips. Okay, so what can we do about reduction in crosstalk 
if we can't do strip line routing and we're stuck working on the top and bottom layer, like such as with a four layer board, or we have a situation where the dielectrics are so different that we still get some crosstalk. In order to reduce the crosstalk, we would then need to reduce the C sub M and the L sub M values between these two traces. So there are a few really simple ways that you can do that and help reduce crosstalk. I actually watched a few years ago in one of Eric Bogatin's talks, a really simple way to do it, which is to just go with wider traces on a fixed thickness for your dielectric. So if this is my thickness of my dielectric and I keep that fixed and I opt for slightly wider traces, I'm actually gonna reduce the inductance of those traces. That's gonna reduce this L sub M over L sub L value in total because it's also gonna reduce the, the mutual inductance. So altogether, you will get less crosstalk. Using wider traces for a fixed thickness is one strategy. Just make sure that you don't make them so wide that you then have a problem where you then deviate from your target impedance, assuming these are impedance controlled lines. But you can opt to make the traces wider. Another option that is similar is to bring the ground closer to the traces. So bringing the ground closer to the traces is primarily gonna target the uh, mutual capacitance, but it does also affect the mutual inductance. So bringing the ground closer is another method that you can use, and that is going to help reduce both parasitics. Now what's the surefire way to really reduce coupling between these two traces? Well, it's not gonna be something crazy like guard traces, and using a bunch of stitching vias with copper pour might help at certain frequencies, but it's not gonna be the magic bullet. The best way to do it is to space them out. So take the spacing between these two, S, and just make it bigger. Space them out a little bit. If you space these guys out a little bit, you will always reduce crosstalk. So that is the easiest and best way to reduce crosstalk between these two traces. All right, so this is our intro to crosstalk, and what we're gonna do in an upcoming video is we're gonna actually show an example of how to do a crosstalk simulation in Altium Designer. Altium Designer does have some simulation tools that let you do some stuff with crosstalk. You can even see what happens on an interconnect where crosstalk is induced and there is no termination, and you can examine how termination affects crosstalk. So it's all pretty cool. So we're gonna explore these topics a bit more in some upcoming videos. So make sure you hit the like button and hit the subscribe button. You'll get notifications for when they come out and you can watch all of that great tutorial content. All right, thanks everybody for watching. Make sure to leave your comments and questions in the comments section. Make sure that if you have any stuff that you want us to address in an upcoming Q&A video, you send those questions to YouTube at Altium com. We love getting your questions. We've still got a massive backlog, but you know what? Bring on more questions. We love getting your questions. All right. Thanks everybody. And don't forget to call your fabricator.